morning, everybody. Welcome to the Independent City Council meeting. It's Tuesday, January 28th. It's 7.30 in the morning. We can see light. And uh, appreciate that. Let the record show the councilors are here except for Jerry Hoffman, who is excused this morning. Is there anybody here with uh, visitor or public comments? I don't see anybody rushing the microphone. Uh, under reports, uh, just to keep council informed that uh, continue moving forward, uh, I serve on the uh, Regional uh, Solutions uh, Advisory Committee will be having a meeting at the uh, uh, end of the week, uh, moving some projects forward in our uh, uh, for funding to the region. Uh, I've been really ably assisted by uh, Mr. Klein, who's uh, helped out, not just myself, but uh, helped out in many different ways with the statewide advisory committee. So thank you, David. Appreciate that. The Council of Government's annual meeting is on. Uh, Wednesday night, I will be attending that uh, since I do serve on the board of the uh, local council of government. Uh, that's probably about enough that I need to go. Let's go immediately into uh, uh, council liaison uh, reports. And Ms. Marilyn from Winnipeg. Winnipeg is doing wonderfully. We have lots of new content on the television, and we haven't checked it out recently. Please do. It's channel 17. As we can see you morning, noon, and night. <laughs> In the middle of the night, I can watch you. <laughs> so we're pleased that things are moving the way they should be and look forward to more content for Wednesday as we go along. Well, yeah. and all of us should be alert to the fact that Rod Killen may be coming by to interview us at any time. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to defer the minor report down to the manager report. Jerry's not here this evening, this morning, but uh, um, since the uh, general manager's here, he'll make the report uh, a little bit later in the uh, So, Mr. Peck, the Planning Commission. Well, there's not much to report since the commission hasn't met since the last time we gave a planning report. Um, though many of the members of the commission did attend our session with the consultant regarding changes to see in the gravel deck area. Uh, there, there is a planning commission meeting next Monday, February the 3rd, and they will be looking at a uh, comprehensive plan of maintenance and development. So if you're interested in that, come down. Great, thank you very much. Uh, before we go into the city manager report, I did want to uh, acknowledge in the audience today uh, uh, a uh, city council member from uh, Monmouth, Mr. Schaefer, who is here today.
last Saturday, we met in Paramount Pine working on the meeting plan for the chamber. I thought that was actually very productive as well. I think uh, the new leadership, I think, is really making a difference. I think Natasha is going to take over the helm, and I think it's, you know, it's showing that they, you know, I think they're looking to be more effective with what they do. Uh, I think that's working. Tomorrow night is the COG dinner. said, given the, the, lack, the lack of good information out there, we are responding. Uh, you'll see things in Twitter. I know a number of you are doing done some commercials or are going to have to do so. So we'll, we'll be reaching back out and kind of at least straightening out the record a little bit, trying to make it straight out the record. So you'll see some more information taking out on those lines. So that pretty much closes up my report for the board. Questions to the manager at this moment? Okay, moving forward. I'm going to have the other managers. Mr. Beck, it's your turn. And welcome to council this morning. Well, thank you. And, and thank you all very much. It's, it's actually, I was sitting back there thinking, over the years, uh, in, in my previous lives, I've done a lot of these meetings. And I can't, I can honestly say I haven't always enjoyed them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I want to tell you, I thoroughly enjoyed these meetings, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, you know, I, I, I actually have a question why I'm even here, David. You just always take all the right <laughs> I just say good news. Oh, no, okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, staff, uh, it has been five months, or it will be five months, uh, at the Super Bowl since I uh, uh, came to these two communities, and, and my wife and daughter. 
you know, some days it seems like it's only been five months since I've been here, but most days it seems like, wow, it's only been five months since I've been here. Uh, so some of it seems short, some of it seems long. Uh, recently, in fact, last week, uh, with the help of a business-centric CFO, which we have on contract staff at Pioneer, along with the buy-in, uh, or buy-off, however you want to put it, of my technical staff, my sales staff, my CSR staff, my office management staff. Uh, we presented to our board of directors a business uh, recast it, business plan and recast it a set of financials, which addressed those things that uh, I believe I'm here to get accomplished with my own. Those things are really four different categories. One is to stabilize the company uh, such that it can improve and sustain the financial performance to a level whereby the company can build a debt service fund, which I'll call commercial bond debt, that will be fully capable of funding its debt service time requirements on a semi-annual basis without further uh, subsidy from the city. Secondly, to stabilize the company to sustain and improve my financial performance to a level whereby the company can build a debt service fund, which I'll call the municipal loan debt uh, that will additionally fund the debt service shortfall loans that the city is in full. Stabilize the company to sustain and improve my financial performance to a level whereby the company can begin setting targets for building an operating reserve fund and a capital reserve fund. And once my is sufficiently stabilized, we can begin investigation and due diligence in seeking new opportunities to expand both our existing suite of services, new services, and perhaps even new markets. So stability and growth. A lot of fancy words for stability and growth. Uh, and we are encouraged that we can actually accomplish this. And I, I am rather reticent uh, to make those statements because the past statements similar to that that you've heard. Uh, but we are at MyNet very encouraged that we have done our appropriate homework, analyzed where we are, are at cleaned up our operating procedures so that we have, we have set a course by which if we follow it, we feel we can get this done. So therefore, we're encouraged. Um, but you know, we can't do it alone. We need help to get all of this done. And we need uh, everyone's help. Uh, the help that we need acquiring our rightful customer base. And I would ask everyone, uh, council, staff, public, any MyNet customer that uh, views this or that is spoken to by anyone that hears this, uh, to remember why MyNet was built in the first place. These two cities were basically told to go pound sand that they didn't really need current generation technology. Why they chose to tell us that, I guess it's their business, but that's what they told us. We're strong enough individuals that we said, you know what, that isn't the answer we're going to accept. If you won't do it, you won't give us what everybody else has in Portland, in Minneapolis, or Chicago. We'll do it ourselves. How do we do that? We did it by making every one of our citizens the owner of my name. So every one of our citizens has a responsibility to my net themselves. So I'm asking everyone to do this. I, I was thinking about, you know, when I've asked my kids to do things, I'll say, could you stop doing that for a year? Well, oh, no, can't, can't stop doing it for a year. Could you stop doing it for six months? Well, probably not for something. 
Could you stop doing it for a day? Oh yeah, I could stop doing it for a day. So rather than negotiate with you, the staff, people here, the public, I'm going to ask each of you to do one thing for my Find us one community festival. Each of you, just one. Not 10, not 12, not 30. Just one. We'll take care of them, and we'll keep them, and we'll continue to grow them. That's my report for today. Any questions? questions? Anybody? I just want to, uh, as a comment, I've had a chance to, to visit with my next staff in the last couple of weeks on a couple of occasions. I'm very encouraged with where they're going. I like the, uh, uh, the energy and the effort, and I really like how you just define the challenge. We get uh, 100 customers, uh, it's good for them, it's good for the whole community. Everybody wins. Love that. Anybody else? Thank you for coming in this morning. So, before you, you sit down to dinner tonight, think about who did you talk to that isn't a minor customer? Did you ask them? Bias. <laughs> no, bias. What people? Thank you. Thank you. I think we have Ms. Gloria, I think, is scheduled to be the next person. Um, I have to apologize. I promised you the last time that this would be in your packet. Okay. <laughs> and it's not. Uh, I would really like it. Um, I hope that you've had a few minutes anyway to, to look at it a little bit, but um, I think really the, the big highlight for this is um, uh, I brought in the beginning time balances from our uh, audit, and it is quite a bit better than we had projected for our budget. Uh, there's, I outlined several things from my analysis of what contributed to that. Um, the, I, I think the big thing is that we really hit ourselves as we, in the last six months of uh, 2013, and our budget this next year is pretty much along the same lines. So. With that, I would, I hope and, and uh, predict that we're going to end up again with a strong time balance. Um, our one caveat of that is would be the exception would be what we've already had to bear in mind for this, this budget year. Um, Fortunately, we've gotten some really great news that we shouldn't have to do that anymore this year. So, uh, with that, we should be able to recover pretty well um, from the December debt service payments. Uh, other than that, uh, I think a lot of a lot of what we see in the improved financials is again a better economy. Things are not too bad a lot, but it's improving. It's stabilizing, and it's coming around a bit to help us out. Uh, that's that's pretty much all all I have. Um, if I if you have any questions. <coughs> nice number. Anybody have questions? Pretty straightforward. Thank you very much for a happy report. Yeah. Appreciate that. Okay, we're uh, going to move into uh, because uh, Dave.
in your packet on page two is just a uh, an article that I found while I was cleaning up in my office. You can imagine the tremendous number of files I've been taking through trying to give them to people that need to have them. But it was an article I kept out because I thought it was especially uh, good in explaining why law enforcement are actually all the emergency services are important to the vitality of the community. And, and so I just asked that it be put in your uh, packet so you can read it. And I hope that you'll be examining our staffing level in the future. In the next couple of years, you'll be looking again at only the staffing level of our police department. And I'll, I hope you'll consider back about this article and, and think about the fact that law enforcement is a lot more than just arresting criminals. It also can make the community more vital, more livable, and, uh, and more inviting to, to new citizens as well as the people that currently reside here. Thank you, Chief. Thank you for providing this for us. Okay. Let's keep moving forward. We don't have any time. about a $4 million project. So 
So he's, he's been planning, staff has been planning on that improvement uh, to get us over the problem at hand, which is sometimes storage. So with that, I'm going to move on uh, with Don and have a little presentation for you, and then we're here to answer questions if you have any. And again, if you'd like to see the whole document or fine for other reasons, just let me know. I can get you a copy. Thank you. Morning, John. Welcome to the office. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I, I do have a PowerPoint presentation. Karen has graciously offered to run the get the computer started for me, but I also have uh, the slides of the PowerPoint that I'd like to hand out to council members and staff, uh, so you can look at some of them. Of course, you lose some detail whenever you put it up on a, on a smaller screen. start off first uh, by thanking mayor, council members, and staff. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, the city for 20 years now. Uh, our first project I worked on was the city uh, street improvement project, uh, and it's continued uh, most of my work with my mentions and on the wastewater side of things, but also has included uh, highways, uh, the amphitheater, the park. Uh, it has been very satisfying, for personally and professionally, to have that involvement, watching the community reshape itself. Uh, and on the occasions when I do have a chance to meet with you, I do want to say thank you. That is uh, something I appreciate you doing. Uh, the purpose today is to talk about the wastewater system. Uh, and yeah, I can say thank you again for indulging me. This is something that I spend quite a bit of time working on. It's not something everyone wants to spend a lot of time discussing, but uh, we're at that point now where we really need to kind of cover some, some items. Um, the facilities plan is a master planning document. Uh, Karen, I may need your help. It's really two documents. What you have uh, before you is the executive summary that's part of your packet, and that's the engineering portion of it. And uh, that's what we will be sending to DEQ. The companion document is an environmental planning document that is required to show that you are advancing uh, an alternative that is environmentally consistent with the goals of the state and federal agencies. Uh, that, that document is about 70% in order to take it to the final 30%, we want to make sure that we have the technical side of things consistent, and DEQ is in agreement with that. Uh, but overall, the document takes a look at a 20% horizon. Um, it's looking at the entire system, and that is collection, treatment, and disposal. Uh, we take a look and we evaluate alternatives, and uh, <coughs> we come up with our recommendations. So today I wanted to make sure that we update you, as Mike mentioned, the last time I had a chance to, to meet with you folks was uh, 2009. Uh, we have modified the document significantly. The approach hasn't changed that dramatically, but the big change is that we're, we are cognizant of the financial constraints that everybody is operating under right now. And what we're trying to create is an approach that allows us to phase in those improvements in a manner that's affordable <coughs> matches your population growth without leaving you at risk for, uh, for violation of your permits. Uh, the other thing is I want to want to make sure and get confirmation that you're ready for us to go ahead and move this to DEQ, and that's submitting the draft to their review. And most importantly, all of it is uh, by giving you an opportunity to ask a question to hear what we're up to. We don't want to surprise you. So, uh, Real quick 
as a refresher for those who don't spend a lot of time uh, like I do, we really have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the, the system is three components. You collect it, and in independent, we have five pump stations. And you can see that schematic shows those five pump stations on the left. They pump it to the wastewater plant where it's metered and it's distributed onto uh, the lagoons. Finally, it's chlorinated and discharged to the river. Monmouth and its tenants share a discharge to the river. We have a permit that you share, an NPDES permit. And one characteristic that's very important is that you are not allowed to discharge between the months of June through October. And that's common for lagoon systems because that's when the river flows are low and the dilution in the river is, is poor. Uh, and that becomes very important because that means that your lagoon system serves as a giant bathtub. And that's one of the big concerns that we're facing right now. If you step back, look at an aerial, um, you can see that right in the center of those lagoons at the top is where those five pump stations discharge and then they flow counterclockwise through the lagoon system where they're discharged into uh, the chlorine contact chamber, they're chlorinated, uh, they enter the outfall line, which flows out William Street to the Willamette River, uh, and it's joined with the treated and disinfected effluent from Monmouth. If you step back one more aerial, I've shown up on the left hand side, you see kind of a square shape with a diagonal running across it, those two lagoon cells. That was 1960 that those two cells were built. That's when this treatment plant was first started, 50 years ago. In the mid 70s, they added the other two cells to it. Uh, so, really, we have a facility that's 35 to 50 years old, depending on how you, how you do your arithmetic. Uh, and what's happened, and, and this is something to be very cognizant about, is that the city has grown up around it. We've got residential on the left side or west side. We've got residential on the south side. We've got an airport runway north of the lagoons, just on the final approach, the runway 3-4. Uh, and, and we have uh, industrial land, we sell land just north of the lagoons. Uh, so that, that begins to limit some of the alternatives we have for Uh, going back even higher, I wanted to give some context of where we fit in with uh, Monmouth because the two communities are really linked in terms of their permit. You'll see on the left side, west, I've circled uh, the green circle is the Monmouth Lagoon System. And then there's the blue line that extends on over to the Willamette River passing through the second green circle, which is the Independence Lagoon System. And that blue line, of course, is the outfall that goes to the river. In the bottom left-hand corner, you can see in light green uh, is the state general area. It's not exact, but the general area of what of the effluent, other times spray irrigation that Monmouth has developed. Uh, and they've had that in operation almost 15 years, very successful. Uh, what you'll see up in the upper top of it is another bright green rectangle, and that's where we are proposing to develop the first phase. We have been in discussions with Lafayette Farms. They're interested in it, um, and uh, I think it's going to be mutually beneficial to both parties. Uh, we did look at, uh, many times we've looked at the possibility of Kumbaka using their Monmouth system. Uh, what we found after uh, a number of iterations is that uh, it, not only the cost If you'll indulge me for a minute with a little bit of humor, I think the analogy, though, has some validity to it. When the lagoons were built in 1960, this was the technology of the cars, and they were beautiful, uh, and our lagoon system was beautiful. If you leave that car out without making improvements, uh, you do end up with a much different looking car. Now, public work staff have uh, done a excellent job of keeping things up to date. And I would say that uh, they have something that's very functional. It's 
not necessarily pretty, uh, but it's still doing the job. Uh, they've actually done a little bit better than that. I would say, you know, we have something that uh, they do make some cosmetic improvements. Uh, they have done quite a bit of rip wrapping along the, on the cells to, to make sure that we don't aren't at risk of breaching the lagoon. Uh, but the fact is, and this is where I think the analogy is very similar, we have a technology that is sending out pollutants with the tail bites that are much higher than the technology. That's going to become increasingly more of a challenge for the city to manage its roads because we're not going to be allowed to increase the amount of pollutants to the river that we do and reduce. Uh, we need to come up with more efficient technology. And in fact, there are more efficient technologies out there, and I'll get to those in a minute. But I did want to kind of give some perspective on it. It's an old system, and uh, there, this is an opportunity for us to go through something that's very cost effective. Um, how are we doing, if you look at the three components, the collection system is doing very well. If you recall, prior to 1998 when we did the citywide sewer project, every time we had rainfall in it, we had an overflow. And it really, it was any time we had anything of measure, we had raw sewage coming out the manholes. And that's been a running loop. And that collection system, the pump stations were built, still have uh, a lot of capacity left in them and we can handle it for the next 20 years. That's probably not what the, the real concern is. The real concern is in the treatment facility. And we are running out of summer storage. Uh, we're beginning to see some concerns with the biological treatment. You know, those are the two components with the uh, lagoon system, storage and treatment. Uh, we also know that the standards at, at the Lima River are going to become more stringent. And finally, uh, recognizing that there may be some changes at the outfall 20 years from now. So getting the concentration of the pollutants down is to be to our advantage long term. Uh, so again, the summary is the immediate concern twofold. Highest priority is that we're running out of room in that bathtub that we can just store it during from June to October. And the second is we are starting to see signs that we're pushing the limits of biological. So what does that mean in terms of numbers? The remaining capacity for storage in the summer, I would say that you've got about, you're within 5% of the original plant volume. And that means that uh, if you turn that into people, um, we could accommodate another 250 residents, which is gonna happen pretty quick. Uh, right now we've been in a relatively flat growth pattern. Um, all that takes is a couple of very large apartment complexes or a single family residential development. Uh, coming up uh, in the future, of course, is when will we run out of that treatment capacity? And we've got a little bit more time on that. I, we're estimating that we got about 12% of that treatment capacity left. Turning that into a population, what's the big room? There we go. Uh, turning that into population, that's about another, oh, say 1,100 people. Uh, keep that in mind. So. This is for the treatment itself, how much can it treat 1,100 people. And if we look at our population projections on this next slide, um, right now we're at in 2000, so 2013, I think that's 2014, because we rolled over one month, but the population's the same. You add 1,100 onto that, and it looks like sometime in the next five to seven years, uh, if we grow at 2.5%, uh, we're going to start to hit that, that limit. So phase one, expanding the lagoon for summer storage is critical. Phase two is out there, something to be keeping in mind and planning for. Uh, this assumes a 2.5% growth. Uh, you'll see on the next slide, there's some basis for it. This shows how the population has fluctuated from 1970 until now. On the right side, you see four different graphs. You know, the, the second one from the bottom with the circle, that's a two and a half percent growth rate. Above that, I think it's a three and a three and a half percent. Statistically, when we've 
run that out from 1930 through now, the 2.5% growth rate matches almost spot on. Uh, we just this very uh, consistent growth, but obviously we have flat times and sometimes rapid growth. Um, last thing I'll point out, uh, and I won't get into the weeds on these numbers, but I did want to make you aware of it, and then I'll quickly move into what the recommendations are for dollars. If you look in that column that says 2013 value, the top two numbers, the 0.61 is what could be our average in the summer months. 0.61 million gallons a day. A little more than half a million gallons a day. The, the flows in the system jump up when we have an extreme rainfall event. We'll see that go 15 times higher. And right now we're measuring about 8.5 million gallons a day. The reason I wanted to point that out is there's a benefit to having those lagoons because they have to go over during those peak events. Uh, so I don't think the idea is uh, ever moving away from all of the lagoons, but I think those can be reduced significantly in the next 20 to 50 years to where uh, we still provide that buffer, but we still move toward a very efficient technology around what's going on. Other than that, I will dwell on so what's required, we need to manage the summer flows, we need to expand the treatment capacity, and we need to go to a more efficient technology. Uh, so for management of summer flows, we looked at the, recognizing that that treated effluent is actually, it didn't used to be thought of as a slug solution. Uh, it's actually a marketable commodity, and uh, you can use it for agriculture. We have found somebody who said, I don't want to take it. Uh, it's also potential, as you cleaned up even or you can attract some industries. There are some that are very interested in having that clean water, which would be membrane treatment that you were talking about, and it's a crystal facility. It, looking down the line, if we're able to develop this and begin to integrate it into your building code and start to use it for irrigation of uh, landscaping and industrial property, potentially in parks in the future, it means that you can reduce the demand of portable water. Every gallon that you use to recycle is a gallon of water you don't have to pump and treat. So there is some double savings if it's done properly. And then finally, um, it does represent an enhancement to the community uh, environment as well as it's being respectful. Uh, I mentioned before we looked at the options for that was one purchasing irrigation rights in Monmouth. Uh, another was developing the local irrigation site, which is what we're recommending now. And then another is to begin adopting that as part of your code. Uh, Peters have done that, they use purple pipes and they just get recycled water. Um, right now, uh, we did start initial discussions with Lafayette Farms north of town, and you can see uh, the bottom uh, we've got the lagoons just up north of the airport, Lafayette Farms. Uh, it's a total of just under 500 acres. We estimate that we need about 200 acres to get us to the next 20 years. Uh, Jay Lim off the F has expressed an interest in, in uh, as much water as we can provide in terms of the increased yields that we would need. Uh, and it's our recommendation that we go ahead and enter into an agreement for all of that land. Um, so then the, the last thing to look at is, okay, what's happening in phases two and three when we start to look at treatment alternatives? And uh, this is where we get into the weeds again uh, with DEQ. We have to show that we've looked at a, a lot of different alternatives. And uh, we did look at aerating the lagoon, similar to what Monmouth has done. We looked at activated sludge, oxidation ditches, which were very popular technologies in the 1970s. And the last two, sequencing batch reactors and membrane bioreactors, MBRs, are technologies that have come out in the last two decades uh, that have allowed us to shrink the footprint and produce tremendously more efficient pollution. Uh, tremendously, tremendously 
more efficient at producing that protein load. Right now, for numbers, we're putting out 30 milligrams per liter. A good MDR plant puts out 3 milligrams per liter. And as I mentioned before, you're not going to get an increase in load in the plant rivers. So the solution is to decrease that concentration. Um, our recommendation as we grind through the numbers, and you'll see on the next slide, don't get too excited. This is a present worth analysis. This isn't the cost of developing the plant. This is, this is a comparison where we looked at the cost to construct them and operate them for 20 years. Uh, because it doesn't do any good if you build a cheap plant that is way too expensive to operate. And what we, what we see is that uh, the MBR plant and the SBR plant are really very close to the cost of an, the retrofitting of a nuclear reservation. And there are some, some other benefits, uh, particularly given the constraints of our wind system to go with one of those technologies. Our recommendation is to proceed with alternative number five, the MBR plant. And uh, the least cost to build is uh, one of the least costs to maintain long term. Uh, and the last caveat I put to that is that those plants, uh, the cost of buying and operating those has been dropping rapidly in the last 10 years. And I think that five years, 15 years would likely to see uh, even greater cost increases. So to summarize it, the recommendation is phase one, build the effluent reuse facility beginning immediately. We already have a grant application in front of the CDBG requesting the money to help fund the water recycling plant that DEP requires. Uh, phase two, if population growth demands it, is to come in with the first phase of an NBR plant as additional treatment. Phase three, looking out there again if population demands it, which is we're estimating to be 15 years out, uh, to come in with an additional module plant as one advantage of this technology is that it can be brought in and modulated to match what you need. Uh, and, uh, and again, we've got some dates there. I, we put them out there based on that 2.5% population growth rate that's very flexible. We don't have to go with the uh, Phase two, we're estimating at, uh, what we said, the low end is 3 million, uh, could be as high as 4 million. There, there are still some question marks there. Uh, phase two, the first phase of building the MDR plant, we're estimating at just under $7 million. And then phase three, well, and I'll show you, uh, I've been talking about these. Here's some, we've got four slides of pictures of MDR plants to give you a sense of what we're looking at. Uh, that's a plant, uh, probably very similar to what we would be Construction here in Independence. That's the one that's abandoned dunes. Uh, it's about the same size and treatment capacity as we would need at that phase one. And uh, you can see, even though the picture is kind of fuzzy, it's a much more compact system. Next picture, uh, it just you know it gives you a sense of the fact that they have optimized these. They come up with mechanical electrical systems and you know, filters that. Uh, last slide is something to keep in mind, as I mentioned, the economies of scale as they're spending the time and the money and packing these. This is a, a package unit that's mounted on a trailer, delivered to the site, set down on a concrete pad. And uh, I think it's very realistic to expect that uh, in five years, possibly, but certainly in 15 years, we're going to be seeing this as the type of solution. Tremendous savings because we're not building new buildings, we're not building tanks. Uh, you order these from the factory, they show up, they, they deliver. And if you need a quarter million gallons today, you buy one unit. If you need half a million, but you buy two units, it's going to put into your gutter. Uh, but I guess I, you know, that's it, it's, I wanted to at least put it out there because uh, you know, it's one of the tremendous advantages, I think, from looking at this technology. Industry is embracing it, and, and the costs are coming down. Uh, and that 
last phase that would be reflective of that would be about a third of what we're saying the first phase would be. Uh, as Mike said, and I'll close it off here on this last slide, uh, we have been working closely with Ray Barber of Financial and Economic Analysis, and uh, the first phase uh, definitely is within the, we had an increase that Ray had recommended that council adopted. that were to continue. Um, Ray and I talked informally on that. Uh, we believe that that's actually going to be sufficient to accommodate that second phase that we're going to see. But that's a lot has to be talked about between now and then. So thank you for allowing me to talk wastewater at this time of morning. Uh, it's not often I get a captive audience for this, uh, but I hope that's been helpful and I hope there's any questions we have. Questions for our presenter. So we're expecting, if things go well, that this will be, uh, the, the irrigation portion will be in place for the summer's uh, irrigation season. So. No, I think, I don't think it uh, would be this year. It's probably more practical than it would be the following year. So it's kind of done for the end of the year for the next year. Yeah. There's, a, there's, there's several pieces that have to fall into place. Uh, I would say in our favor, um, he was very supportive of it. Uh, they would like to see us doing something like this. They're supportive of spray irrigation in general, and I think they are aware that we're approaching the end of our capacity. And this is this question is kind of off the cuff slide a little bit, but what's the if we don't start having a little heavier rainfall here soon, are we gonna be facing some problems, maybe an additional month or two where we're not able to discharge?
that's the first is that uh, pretty soon population will put us into a, a level that will be scrutinized more carefully. Um, the second is that there's a general term, pollutants of emerging concern, uh, that we didn't monitor or could even measure 10 years ago, 10 years ago. And that includes uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, caffeine, personal care products, uh, that, that there's a greater uh, concern here. And uh, one of the best ways of tackling that and the potential that those could be from part of our permit is to go into modern technology. SDRs, MDRs are effective at reducing those. So uh, the recommendation to go to that is really partly just a recognition that uh, we start to see the impact of the conversation. An open conversation with other municipalities that even if there is no growth, there is still the rising level of uh, uh, rules that will need to follow. That even if there was no growth, there would still be need for uh, improvements in, um, in, the, in systems such as ours. And so I think it's important that we know that that, um, while, while nothing ever stays in practice,
an ordinance like this. I'll talk about that a little bit more. This ordinance, therefore, drops uh, some of the people that, that uh, we used to be able to check under the old code. Um, typically, for example, um, volunteers at the library, the museum, uh, CERT volunteers, interns that work right here in the city, these are the kind of people that that we would like this ordinance to apply to, as well as the taxi, uh, which is a separate ordinance. So this ordinance, which is 20-6, will allow us, through the police department, to make these checks and do these checks for city departments who ask us to do them. These checks are available all the time. They've been legal forever. But for you to get one done, you have to get the waiver, of course, from the person who's applying. You can always go to the state police and say, I'm pay some money, and you can get this, this check done. What LEDs have done in the past is allowed cities to do this on their own and, and to save the, the cost of travel, the cost of, of asking for the state police to do it. And so this is really a convenient time, as much as anything, for us to be able to do these checks here. Um, in the end, if we do find that a person has a, uh, a criminal history, all we do is say, yes, there is one, or no, there's not. If we tell uh, the department head that, yes, there is a criminal history, then it's sort of up to them to go to state police, get the whole criminal history and determine whether anything in that really has anything to do with the job that's being applied for. So now let me tell you why the attorneys thought we would be best not to have this ordinance. There is a potential liability if you approve the, the ordinance that we would forget to do this or we would do it randomly. If we did either of those things, there's a certain amount of liability for the city. For example, if uh, we normally do these background checks, but for some reason we didn't on someone, that person then kidnaps a child, maybe while they're working at the library. We have some liability that we've assumed as a city because we have this ordinance that allows us to do it, but we didn't. Um, now, and so if we don't have the ordinance, unbelievably, <laughs> the law is very clear. We have no duty to protect the community. Even the police departments don't have a duty to protect. If only if we, the law says only if we assume that liability. So we're assuming that liability if we have this ordinance. Now, I think that's just a training issue. If we train our department heads to always do it consistently, and if we train our people in our office to run the, uh, the checks in the appropriate way and only give the information they're supposed to give, we should have no liability. We've had the ordinance for years and years and years. We, we never had any problem with it. All of our surrounding cities have a similar ordinance. It came out from lead years ago. We said, here's kind of a boilerplate we should have. We all put it in. But understand, there is a liability. And that's why legal counsel thinks that perhaps we should have it because we are accepting liability. So it's sort of a, a um, <clears throat> the, the city attorneys are telling you in your liability here, Maybe you shouldn't do this, and I'm telling you in your crime prevention here, I think you should, <laughs> because I think we we really should uh, look into this. I suspect that the library will still do these checks, even if this ordinance doesn't occur. They'll just have to drive to sale, pay the money, get get the check done. So, and in many ways, it doesn't matter to me because the police department will always do criminal history checks on everyone that works. Police department because the law allows for that specifically. So financially, it shouldn't cost a lot of money. We used to do a lot more than what we're asking for here. The uh, record staff of our police department do these just in the course of the day uh, when they come in. And uh, so then the only possible cost would be a liability issue if we did something wrong or department heads or human services of our department or city. So, your options are there. My recommendation is a new pass. Um, 
is option number one. If you want to look at our old ordinance on page 46 with a lot of the changes that have happened between <laughs> the attorneys and I, but really this isn't a change in the old ordinance. This is asking you to pass a new ordinance. So that new ordinance is on page 51. Questions for uh, David? I, I concur in his advice, which is what <clears throat> That, that's also what insurance is for. So I have <coughs> little to no concern about the exposure. Adding on this duty is, is, is something the public we need for the public. And I think that that is <coughs> Questions? I've had occasion recently to look at the